today. It's really a, an honor to be here and to talk with you about this work. Um, so the short title for my talk is uh, Fate Follows Free Will. And I'd like to uh, amend that a little bit out of humility. The title should really be Fate Could Follow Free Will. I'm going to explain how this could be the case. I'm not going to go so far as to say that it is the case or to prove that. Um, but I'm going to try and give a model for it, uh, the way it works, um, using two theories, two current theories of uh, quantum mechanics, uh, consistent histories and relational quantum mechanics. So it's called retroactive event determination in the interpretation of macroscopic quantum superposition states in consistent histories and relational quantum mechanics. So uh, my goal today is describe an interpretation of macroscopic quantum superposition states. Um, propose that MQS states are all around you all the time, including right now, and examine the flow of time uh, in the process of doing that. We're going to have to relook at, at the flow of time. And, uh, and of course, in keeping with the, the topic of this conference, that will affect our flow of energy. So it might be something to keep in mind. Um, I'd like to elicit feedback about possible experiments, and I'll give you a few experiments uh, that I've thought of or that other people have done that uh, could be performed to, to demonstrate this. And um, as I said earlier, I'm unaffiliated, and I'm not proud of that. I'd like to find collaborators, or um, especially in mathematical geniuses, would be great. Um, I, I come from a physics background. I, I went to Berkeley and uh, was a high school teacher for about 10 years. So um, that's my background. Um, so getting to macroscopic quantum superposition states. Uh, by the way, I'd like to say I, I would very much like your feedback on the, the presentation I give, the format of the presentation, and the topic. So please feel free to give me feedback. I'm here to learn. Macroscopic quantum superposition states. Um, a, a quantum superposition state, for those of you who aren't so familiar with quantum mechanics, is, is one of the central features that make quantum mechanics weird. It's uh, the concept, which I'll try and describe very briefly, but will not do it justice, is that for quantum uh, systems, like electrons and protons, um, they can be in what we would call indeterminate states. Everybody in this room is obviously in a determined state because they're in a single place, they have a single energy, if you were to measure their energy, they have single uh, values for every measurement you can make of them. But uh, quantum systems can take uh, multiple values until you make a measurement. So they can be in what are called superposition states that you cannot predict the outcome until you actually make a measurement and get a definite result. So macroscopic quantum superposition states are actually a prediction of modern quantum theory, not an unfortunate byproduct, but they're often treated as an unfortunate byproduct because people don't understand how um, they could possibly exist in the world. So I'm going to read you a couple quotes from Griffiths. Uh, so you just listen to me. Um, if one supposes that the Hilbert space structure of quantum mechanics is correct, then MQS states will be present in the theory. Because essentially a Hilbert space is a linear vector space, and any combination of, uh, any linear combination of two possible states is also a valid state. So MQS states are equally valid uh, to microscopic quantum superpositions. The reason we get paradoxes such as the uh, delayed choice experiment paradox uh, is from a process of implicitly choosing families which contain no MQS states. We make the assumption that there's, that there's no MQS states because they don't have any physical reality in our minds. We, we think that. And then inferring from this assumption that the future influences the past or that there are mysterious non-local influences. So Griffiths shows that through the ideas of consistent histories, all of these paradoxes can be described, but you do have to include uh, MQS states as part of the, th of the theory. And then, of course, most physicists do not have any intuitive, intuitive idea as to what MQS states mean. And so we, we try to write them out of the theory. I'm going to try and give you an idea of what they could mean uh, today. So thought experiment A. If you'll do me a favor and think about this first statement. Is it possible to know right now, without observation of it, what is going on outside the walls of this room? So we have a certain bounded area that we can observe right now. And outside the walls of this room, I think we would all agree we can't tell what's going on except through observation. Now, that observation could take a number of different forms. We could have a video camera with a live feed into the room. And so we could actually be observing what's going on out there by gaining information about it through a video camera. We could uh, pull out a cell phone and make a phone call to somebody that's outside. Another way of gaining information about what's going on outside this room. But without any of those things, I think we'd all agree that we, if we have no information, from an information theoretic point of view, we can't know what's going on outside the wall of this, uh, walls of this room. So the answer is no. Now, the second question, I'd like to go just a little bit deeper. Is it possible to know right now, without observation of it, whether something definite is going on outside the walls of this room? 
And I think, if you think about it, most of us would probably say, well, I don't know what's going on, but yes, there's something definite going on. And there's a few reasons why we say that there's definitely something definite going on outside the walls of this room, even though we're not observing it. And the reasons for that essentially are every time we have observed it in the past, it's obviously been definite. So anytime we make an observation of something, there's, there's always a definite result. 100% of the time in our lives. So we've got a perfect track record showing us that whenever, you know, that there's something definite going on outside. We can also retroactively go outside the door after this talk. You could walk out there and ask uh, maybe um, somebody's out there uh, with doing the, the front table with papers and, and working on some of the re registration stuff. And we can go out and ask them, well, was there something definite going on during the talk out here? And she would, of course, say, well, yes, there was something definite going on out here during the talk. Ten minutes ago, I was writing, and I was uh, gathering pens for the next session, and all that. So all we know from these two arguments, though, is that when we do make an observation of the outside world, the unobserved world, is that we, we get a definite result. And if we make a retroactive observation, we get a definite result. But I'd really like to ask you uh, sort of an honest assessment. Is there any way to know that right now, outside the walls of this room, there is a definite result without measuring it either in the present or retroactively. And I want to propose that there really is no, no logical way, it's really just a logical argument, a positivist argument, as I put it, um, that that's, it's just information that we cannot gain about the world. And so it's uh, a bad assumption to make the assumption that the world outside this observed reality is definite. So thought experiment B, and this is just very simplistic, and, and I'm sure you can find a lot of holes in it, but I think it'll make my point. Let's say I'm person P, I'm standing in this room, and there's two doors, door one and door two, that I could leave by. And um, let's say person S is uh, some individual who's not in the room right now. They're outside walking around. And, but for some reason, there would be a meaningful coincidence if I ran into person S. So maybe I run into them, I walk out of door one, and I run into person S, and I have a conversation about what I'm interested in in this topic. And, and it actually changes my views of my research, and I go off in a different direction, and it affects my life in the, in the long run. So that's some kind of meaningful coincidence. Or maybe they're a friend of mine that I haven't seen in a long time and I run into them. Uh, we can all probably relate to the idea of meaningful coincidences, at least to some extent, even if we don't believe that they're truly meaningful. So the question I want to ask you is, is it possible to make a free will choice and miss my faded experience? The faded experience I just described happened at door one, but what if I were to choose to walk out of door two? Well, would I, would I completely miss person S? Or, can the faded experience happen regardless of the choice I make? And if so, I want to understand how. So going back to this diagram, uh, we can see just with the very idea of MQS states that person S can be drawn with two possible uh, superposition states. Now again, I'm not observing them, so I cannot say that they're in a definite state. And if I can't say that they're in a definite state, I shouldn't assume that they're in a definite state. And therefore, this model of having two possible macroscopic states is equally valid. Um, so if I, if I then can see that there's a possibility that if I choose door one, I could run into person S at door one. If I choose door two, I could run into person S at door two. And there could be a thousand other possible histories that would unfold. Uh, I've only chosen two for this example. And that's the basic point I want to make. Um, person Q, just to complete the picture, is some third person observer who might know me and might know person S and makes an observation of person S before I do. And we're going to see in relational quantum mechanics that that means that their state is correlated to person S's state. So from my point of view, person Q and person S are now both in a quantum superposition state, one in which person Q measured person S in door, at door one, and person S was also at door one, so they're consistent in their, in their stories, and the other in which person Q measured person S at door two, and person S was at door two, so there's a consistency with their stories. Um, so moving through, I've got two postulates which summarize what we just talked about. Um, only events that one has, has observed exist in a definite state, and only from that individual's perspective. So this room around you is all that you're observing right now, from your perspective, and everything outside of it is in an indefinite state, due to the first argument that I was trying to make earlier. The second postulate is uh, important to avoid paradox. The real world can only be meaningfully described from one single perspective or framework at a time. Uh, there is no objective overview. So the only way you avoid the paradox of me saying I'm in a definite state and person S saying he's, well, me saying he's in an indefinite state, he would say the opposite, that he's in a definite state because he's observing himself and that I'm in an indefinite state. The only way to avoid that is to only look at one perspective at a time. So I can only describe the world through my perspective. And you can do the same, but you can't compare the two. 
This is known as the single framework rule in consistent histories. So I'm going to um, try and go fast through these to uh, get some questions in. Um, relational quantum mechanics, Carlo Rovelli, basically says the state of any system is relative to the observer, not absolute. So what we have here is drawn from P's perspective. We have two possible histories. At the bottom, person S makes a choice. They go down history one or history two. When person Q makes a measurement, they get correlated so that they end up in both histories as well. Now, um, consistent histories, Griffiths especially is what I've read, event chains branch off into various possible histories. So we've already looked at that. The framework of histories depends on the way in which we describe the experiment. It's a very important and subtle argument. We can describe any given experiment with, uh, with any number of frameworks of histories, but we have to stick with one in order to avoid inconsistencies, in order to avoid paradox. So in other words, we have to choose a point of view, in other words, my point of view or your point of view, uh, a particular description and stick with it. Um, this is the mathematics uh, in simplified form of consistent, consistent histories. We have at the, at the left-hand side a single initial state of S, Q, and P. It branches off into history one at the top and history two on the bottom. And you can see that the history remains consistent so that S2 leads to Q2, leads to P2. But what I really want to point out here is that when P makes his measurement and gets history two, let's see, P makes a measurement, he could get either history, right? We don't know which history he'll get. But let's say he makes a measurement and gets history two. Until that point, both histories were in a quantum superposition state. And this is part of consistent histories. So it's only at this point, at the very end, that person P makes a measurement that not only the end result is determined, but also the previous events at time one, two, three, and four also fall back into place retroactively. They weren't determined until this point of measurement at time t equals five. So this diagram, I hope, is, is an entryway to understanding how uh, a, a measurement at time five can retroactively affect the events at time t equals one, two, three, and four. Um, so a, a visual diagram of that is like this. We have the initial state uh, earlier before the measurement on the left when person S is divided into two different histories and person Q is also in those histories. Person P makes a measurement and uh, gets a definite result and therefore the history one, which was only a, a mathematical construct to begin with, ceases to have any meaning. History two is the one that is real and retroactively uh, state, uh, the state of Q and the state of S become determined. Now, um, obviously from S's perspective, this diagram would be totally different because from S's perspective, everything he observes is definite. But from P's perspective, this is the way it looks. So conclusion, things don't actually happen at the time that they happen. There's a retroactive event determination. Events fall into place retroactively in order to align themselves with, the, with what we observe in the world. So when I observe someone walking out of that door, the history that led them to that point is, is falling into place according to this process of consistent histories. Um, you would also have to sort of uh, look at the fact that there's no universally defined present moment. The present moment is defined by me in what I'm observing right now, but everything else outside of that is, is uh, not yet uh, fallen into place. And I, again, my conclusion, fate follows free will. Um, I haven't had time to talk about experiments. I've got a couple ideas here you can read while I take questions. And if you want to ask about experiments, I'd be happy to talk about it. Thank you. Start with a hard one, I'm sure. Um, it, it, it seems to me that underneath most of uh, your, your discussion, the, uh, uh, the, the old chestnut of the other minds problem of philosophy has been sort of, of lurking in a tacit way. And it, it virtually becomes explicit in your postulate too, which seems to me like a, a restatement of solipsism, but with definite substituted in for where a solipsist would say real. I wonder if you could comment on this. Uh, on the basic concept of solipsism, it's, it's integrally part of this, but I, I will summarize and say, no, I don't, I don't believe this is a solipsistic view, and I don't believe the world is just based around my view. Uh, I can describe the world from my view, but that's not the only consistent framework that I can describe using the consistent histories process. Uh, every single other individual's view in this room is equally valid to mine. So it doesn't make any um, greater importance on my view, but it does say that the world is only definitely described from my view, and everything outside of my view is, is not that it doesn't exist, it's very important. It does exist, but it's in some kind of mathematical macroscopic superposition until we observe it. I hope that answers your question a little bit. Okay, Sky? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I have a quick question. Um, is, is your um, view of things or model you have here, is it consistent with 
other interpretations of quantum mechanics, let's say like the relational, uh, let's say the um, um, Copenhagen interpretation or transactional or other ones, or is that is it at odds with um, certain other interpretations of quantum mechanics? Good is question. You know, I, I happen to think that um, all of the interpretations of quantum mechanics are essentially correct in some in some way in some method. So. Um, I, there's some that I know better than others. I think it's very similar to Copenhagen in a lot of ways, and I have huge respect for um, the developers of, of Copenhagen as you know icons. Um, and, and I think it's very similar to those, and I, th I think it does fall into place with the majority of, of the interpretations. I don't know transactional as well, but I think I would. I, I'd like to see experiments done, um, some of which I've seen here at this talk, that could be done retroactively in order to show that these effects are true retroactively. That would be the, the prediction that this makes. same level. Uh, do insects, do microbes? The question is, do animals and microbes and insects have viewpoints on the same level? Uh, I, I haven't shown this to be true, but um, my view uh, in de developing this theory is that every single object is treated as a perspective. So a rock has equal perspective to a human being as an insect or, or any of these things. There's no preferential treatment of consciousness. Um, can you use the microphone, please? Multi-viewpoint pantheistic solipsism. I'd have to dissect that statement. Uh, um, but again, I, I think I agree to some extent with all of the theories of, uh, of quantum mechanics, including many worlds to some extent. The difference between many worlds and, and what I'm proposing is that there aren't really many worlds that definitely exist. There's, there's one present right now, and there's many possible worlds in which it can branch off to, but they don't exist physically. There's only one physical world that exists. And therefore, when we're actually we feel like we're affecting the past, we're not actually, it's not retroactive causation because we're not changing anything that has physically happened. We're actually changing or, or affecting or determining retroactively things that have not yet been determined. So there's nothing physical that's being uh, affected by the choices or the changes that we make. Are there other questions? And thank you very much, Sky. Thank you very much, I appreciate it.